Okay, so get this. You can actually have a heart that's not pumping at full power and not even know it. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? It really is. And today we're diving deep into that world heart failure compensation. Ah, yeah. Trust me, it's way more interesting than it sounds. Oh, it definitely is. It's fascinating. Your body is a master at, well, basically covering up for a struggling heart. At least for a while. At least for a while. Um, so how does it pull this off? Well, picture this. Your heart is like a pump. Okay. That's starting to weaken. Gotcha. It's not delivering enough blood and oxygen to your body. But get this, instead of like, you know, waving a red flag, your body misinterprets the signals. So it's like, oh, something's wrong. We need more. Yeah. It thinks we need more fluid. Fluid. And kicks into overdrive, trying to increase blood volume. So it's like trying to fix a leaky faucet by just cranking up the water pressure. Exactly. I like that. Yeah. And this overdrive response, it involves two key players, your nervous system and your hormonal system. Okay. Let's unpack this. Nervous system first. What's its role in all of this? Think fight or flight. Okay, classic. But instead of a tiger, it's a failing heart. Gotcha. It's your sympathetic nervous system, the one that usually handles emergencies. It steps in and releases these powerful chemicals called catecholamines. Catecholamines. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? Well, they constrict your blood vessels, which raises blood pressure, and they also rev up your heart rate. Okay. To try and push more blood to those vital organs. So it's like your body is constantly on high alert, even when there's no immediate danger. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's always in that go, go, go mode. But what about the hormonal system? How does that fit into this picture? That's where things get really interesting. Okay, you hear me. It's this complex hormonal cascade called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system or RAS. RAS, got it. And what does RAS do? Well, it further tightens those blood vessels. Oh, wow. And it makes your body cling to salt and water. Oh, no. So it's a double whammy. Pretty much, yeah. Squeezing the pipes and adding more fluid to the system. Exactly. Ingenious. Yeah. But I have a feeling this can't be good in the long run. You're right to be skeptical. Okay, good, good. While these compensatory mechanisms buy your body some time, they're not a permanent solution. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken bone. Yeah, you know, covering up the problem but not actually addressing it. Exactly. Okay, so we've covered how the body tries to compensate, but what about the heart itself? Oh, yeah. It's not just a passive bystander in all of this. Doesn't it try to pitch in and help? Oh, absolutely. The heart is a fighter. It is. Its main goal is to maintain something called cardiac output. Right. Which is basically the amount of blood pumped out per minute. Right, because that determines how well your organs are being fed, all that good stuff. Exactly. So how does the heart try to keep up with this demand? Well, it's got two main strategies. Beating faster. Okay. And trying to squeeze out more blood with each beat. It's like trying to get more horsepower out of a sputtering engine. I like that. Okay, let's dive into those. So how does the heart manage to beat faster? when it's already weakened. Your brain sends signals through the heart's electrical system. So it's like a faster tempo. Exactly. And uh -huh. remember those catecholamines we talked about? Yeah. They ramp up the heart rate too. So it's like a double dose of speed for the heart. Yeah. But if it's beating faster, that means it has less time to refill with blood between beats. Right. Sounds counterproductive. A little bit. You've hit on a crucial point. Okay. A rapid heart rate can actually weaken the heart muscle over time. How so? Because it doesn't have enough time to rest and refill properly. So it's like running a marathon at a sprint. Exactly. You might make some progress, but you're going to burn out. Exactly. So speeding things up is only a temporary fix. It is. What about the other strategy, squeezing out more blood with each beat? Think of it like blowing up a balloon. The heart tries to take in more blood by expanding its size. Oh, okay. It's a process called dilation. So bigger chambers mean more blood. Yes. That seems like a good thing. Initially, yes. But as the heart stretches more and more, it puts a strain on the heart walls. I see. So that's where the problem comes in. Yeah. And they can get thinner and weaker. So imagine stretching a rubber band too far. Exactly. It loses its elasticity and then snap. Yep. Not good. Not good. So dilation is kind of a double-edged sword. It is. Are there any other ways the heart tries to increase its output? There is. The heart muscle itself can thicken okay. to try and pump harder, and yeah. that's called hypertrophy. So it's bulking up at the gym, but for your heart. That's a great way to put it. So a thicker, stronger muscle should be able to pump more forcefully. In theory, yes. At first, yes. But here's the catch. 
as the muscle gets bigger, it needs more oxygen, okay. more nutrients to keep up. And sometimes the heart's own blood supply can't keep up with this demand. It's like building a bigger engine without upgrading the fuel lines. Exactly. You might get a temporary boost, but you risk damaging the engine. Exactly. And to make matters worse, hypertrophy can also make the heart stiffer. Oh, no. Yeah, making it harder to relax and fill properly. So it's kind of defeating the purpose. Right, which further reduces cardiac output. Wow. So even the heart's attempts to compensate can have some serious downsides. Yeah, it's a delicate balance. It is. It seems like the body is fighting a losing battle. It can feel that way sometimes. But we do have ways to help. Good. What happens when these compensatory mechanisms, both from the body and the heart, just can't keep up anymore? Well, that's when you start to see the classic symptoms of heart failure, which we can divide into two main categories, congestive symptoms okay. and low output symptoms. Got it. That sounds ominous. Let's dive into those. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, congestive symptoms and low output symptoms. So congestive symptoms first, what exactly are they and what causes them? Well, it happens when the heart isn't pumping efficiently enough Okay. to keep that blood moving forward gotcha. at a normal pace. So it causes the blood to back up uh -huh. or congest in different parts of your body, like creating this log jam in your circulatory system. So rush hour traffic in your veins and arteries. Exactly. Okay, which parts of the body are usually most affected by this backup? The lungs are usually the first to feel the pressure. Makes sense. Yeah, blood backs up into the vessels of the lungs, causing fluid to leak into the air sacs. Leading to shortness yeah. of breath. Especially when... Especially when you're lying down. Yeah, that doesn't sound fun. No, not at all. Any other symptoms that someone might experience? Yeah, another common one is swelling. Okay. Or edema. Edema? Mm -mm. You might notice it in your legs and ankles. Okay. Sometimes even in your abdomen. So why the swelling? It happens because fluid is leaking from your blood vessels into the surrounding tissues. Interesting. Yeah. So those are the congestive symptoms. What about low output symptoms? What are those all about? Low output symptoms occur when the heart just isn't pumping enough blood yeah. to meet your body's needs. And this can lead to, well, a lot of things like fatigue, weakness, feeling lightheaded. It's like your body's running on fumes. Exactly. Yeah. Are there any other serious consequences of this reduced blood flow? Yeah, if the cardiac output drops significantly, uh -oh. it can actually lead to organ damage, oh. especially to the kidneys. Kidneys, wow. You might see a decrease in urine output. Interesting. And in severe cases, it can even lead to kidney failure. Oh, wow. So it's a domino effect. It really is. This whole compensation act can only delay the inevitable for so long. That's true. How long can the body typically keep this balancing act going? That's a tough question to answer. Yeah, I bet. It really depends on the underlying cause of the heart failure. Okay. Your overall health, other individual factors. So many variables. A lot of variables, yeah. Some people might compensate for years. Right. With few noticeable symptoms. Exactly. While others might experience a, a more rapid decline. It really varies. So there's no one size fits all answer. Yeah. Not when it comes to this. No. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. This has been incredibly eye opening. I'm glad to hear that. I know we've only just scratched the surface of this complex topic. Yeah, definitely. Before we wrap up this part of our deep dive, I want to leave you with something to ponder. Okay. I like it. We've talked about how the body and the heart try to compensate for heart failure. Right. What other factors might influence how long and how effectively your body can maintain this balancing act? Ooh, that's a good one. Think about that as we move on to the next part of our exploration. All right. Where we'll uncover the hidden dangers of your body's amazing compensatory mechanisms. Looking forward to it. Welcome back to our deep dive into heart failure. So we've explored how our bodies try to compensate, but now let's talk about what we can do to actually, like, manage and even prevent this whole thing. Right, because knowledge is power, right? Exactly. Understanding how to protect your heart is so important. So let's start with treatment. What are the main goals? Well, the main goals are really to relieve symptoms, slow down how the disease progresses, and just improve quality of life. Makes sense. It's not just about living longer, it's about living well. Absolutely. So what are the key strategies to achieve those goals? Usually a combination of things, lifestyle changes, medications, and sometimes surgery. Okay, so a holistic approach. Let's break that down a bit. Lifestyle modifications. What kind of things can people do that can actually make a difference? Oh, lifestyle's huge. Okay, good. I mean, things like eating a heart-healthy diet, 
watching your salt intake, staying active, and absolutely quitting smoking. Yeah, smoking is never good. Not for your heart, that's for sure. Okay, so it's really about incorporating healthy habits into daily life. It really is. What about medications? What role do they play? Medications are like the workhorses of heart failure treatment. There are different types, each working in different ways. Some common ones are ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, diuretics, and digoxin. Wow. That's a lot. Can we do a quick rundown of what each one does? Sure. Think of your heart like a car engine. Okay, I like this. ACE inhibitors, they ease off the gas pedal. Relaxing blood vessels, reducing the workload. Gotcha. Beta blockers, they're like shifting into a lower gear, slowing the heart rate, lowering blood pressure. Giving the heart a break. Exactly. Yeah. Diuretics, they're like fixing a leaky radiator, helping flush out excess fluid. I see. And digoxin, it's like a tune-up, helps the heart beat stronger and pump more efficiently. Wow, I love that analogy. <laughs> it makes it so much clearer. So it sounds like these medications work together to keep that heart engine running smoothly. Mm. But what happens when lifestyle changes and medications just aren't enough? Yeah, in more advanced cases, doctors might look at surgical procedures. Okay. Things like inserting a pacemaker to regulate the heart's rhythm, or even more complex surgeries like heart valve repair or replacement. And of course, in the most severe cases, a heart transplant might be the best option. It's amazing how far medical technology has come. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. What can people do to lower the risk of developing heart failure in the first place? You're absolutely right. And a lot of it goes back to those lifestyle changes we talked about. Maintaining a healthy weight, balanced diet, regular exercise, managing stress, and definitely not smoking. So it's really about being proactive and taking charge of your health. Exactly. Well, this has been an amazing deep dive into heart failure. It really has. Learning about the body's resilience and all the innovative ways we can support our heart health. It's been a fascinating journey. It has. We hope this has inspired you to make those heart-healthy choices and keep your heart beating strong for years to come. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.